Welcome back. I'm a bit down today because of the flu. So yeah, that's a bummer. But I have this really cool integral. So yeah, it's not all that bad. And we have this log x and the sine of x squared. So yeah, you probably would have guessed by now that we're going to get a pretty cool result at the end. But this time it's not the result that's got me excited. It's the actual solution development because it allows me to use two of my favorite tricks or integration hacks. And it's a pretty cool solution development as I'm about to show you. I've already called the integral i for reference purposes, so that's step one done. But now I'd like to make a substitution by letting x squared equal to u, which implies that x equals root u, which implies that dx equals one half of root u, times root u anyway, du. So this implies that i is now an integral still from zero to infinity because our limits are clearly not bothered of log root u times the sine of u and the new differential element is du by two times root u. So this can be written as one half times the integral from zero to infinity but wait a minute this is log root u and we know that we can write this as one half of log u so that means instead of one half, I have a quarter outside, log u, sine u, and we also have this u to the negative one half being multiplied by it, and we're integrating with respect to u. Okay, cool, but now I'd like to rename the dummy variable back to x, because it doesn't matter what you call the dummy variable, you can just rename all the u's back to x, because that doesn't alter the structure of the integral. The structure remains intact, so it's the same integral. We have the integral now of x to the negative one half times sine x times log x dx. And now I'd like to introduce a bit of complex analysis because why not? We have the sine function. And we know from Euler's wonderful formula that the imaginary part of e to the i x is the sine function, that's sine x. So this implies that i equals a quarter of the integral from zero to infinity. The imaginary part of that integral, that is, so let me just write that out. The imaginary part of the integral from zero to infinity of x to the negative one half times e to the i x times log x dx. And now to integrate this thing my favorite way, that is the Feynman way. Let's define the integral function i of some parameter alpha as the integral from zero to infinity of x to the alpha times e to the i x dx. And this works perfectly fine because if you differentiate with respect to alpha, then we have the derivative with respect to alpha of this integral. And switching up the differentiation and integration operators, we get, because of the Leibniz rule, the integral from zero to infinity of the partial derivative with respect to alpha of x to the alpha times e to the i x dx. Okay, cool. So that means because we're integrating, oh, we're differentiating partially, we have this constant e to the i x term times the derivative with respect to alpha of x to the alpha. So that's the repeated function times the logarithm of your constant base, constant in the x world, uh, in the alpha world anyway. So that's the derivative with respect to alpha. So that means for the target integral, all I need to do is plug in alpha equal to negative one half and multiply the whole thing by a quarter. So the target integral i is one quarter of the derivative of your function evaluated at alpha equal to negative one half. And now the question is, how exactly do we evaluate i of alpha and then we can differentiate it? And now for my other favorite tool, that is the Laplace transform. Let me just rewrite this down here. And now we can recall the Laplace transform of the function x to the alpha. This is a function of the complex parameter s and is the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative st times x to the alpha dx. Oh wait, uh, I'm using x now instead of the usual variable t. Terribly sorry about that. But I am a bit under the weather and I make 
those kind of silly mistakes quite often, even when I'm well. So yeah, cut me some slack. Anyway, terribly sorry about that. So we have this integral, which is the Laplace transform. And as per our trusted table of Laplace transform, this evaluates to the gamma function at alpha plus one divided by s to the alpha plus one. Okay, cool. So that means on comparing the two structures, the two integrands, we see that s in fact equals negative i, or the reciprocal of i, which is extremely cool. I always mention that it's very cool that the negative of the imaginary unit is its own reciprocal. I always find that really nice, honestly. I always do. So that means my integral function i of alpha evaluates out to the gamma function evaluated at alpha plus 1 divided by the value of s here is 1 by i to the alpha plus 1. And this, of course, can be written as i to the alpha plus 1 times the gamma function at alpha plus 1. And to deal with this i to the alpha plus 1 thingy, again, I'm going to call on Euler's formula. We know that e to the i pi by 2 equals i. Okay, cool. So this implies that i of alpha is actually just e to the i pi by 2 times alpha plus 1 times the gamma function at alpha plus 1. Okay, that is cool. Now I have the structure. I have the integral function completely in terms of the parameter alpha. And recall I needed the imaginary part of it. So what is exactly the imaginary part of e to the i pi times alpha plus 1? Well, let's expand this. We have imaginary part of the cosine of pi by 2 alpha plus pi by 2 plus i times the sine of pi by 2 alpha plus pi by 2. So because of the phase shift of pi by 2, this implies that the imaginary part of e to the i pi by 2 times alpha plus 1, in fact, equals the cosine of pi by 2 times alpha. Okay, that is cool once again. So this implies that imaginary part of i of alpha equals uh, this cosine term, this cosine function of alpha times this gamma function of alpha. Now recall that we needed to differentiate this thing. So on differentiation, we have the imaginary parts derivative, which is the, wait, I need some writing space over here to accommodate the various terms because of the product rule. So that gives me a negative pi by two times the sine of pi alpha by two times gamma alpha plus one plus cosine pi alpha by 2 times gamma prime at alpha plus 1. And recall that our target integral i was this derivative evaluated at alpha equal to a quarter. No, alpha equal to negative 1 half. Yeah, it was alpha equal to negative 1 half, and you had to multiply by a quarter. So that means we have 1 quarter times negative pi by 2 times sine of, what is the sine of negative pi by 4? That is negative 1 by root 2. So you have some nice cancellation happening there. Times the gamma function at 1 half, which is, of course, wonderfully root pi. Plus the cosine of, now the cosine is an even function, so you get 1 by root 2. And you need the derivative of the gamma function at 1 half. And I have an Instagram write-up link in the description below for the important derivatives of the gamma function. So according to that awesome write-up, the derivative of the gamma function at one half is quite nicely negative root pi times the euler mascheroni constant plus log four. Okay, so this implies that i equals a quarter of pi times root pi by two times root two. That does look quite nice. Plus one by root two, so that's a negative root pi by root two times Euler Mascheroni plus log 4. Okay, so I can factor out 
this root pi term as well as the the term of root 2 and I'm also going to take with me this term as well so I can write this as 1 8 so 1 by 8 times root pi by 2 yeah that's exactly it so you get one ha uh, the cube of 1 half times root pi by 2 times this really cool result that is pi minus twice the older Mascheroni constant minus two times log four. Okay, that is a very gorgeous result indeed and a really cool integral that I evaluated using Feynman's trick plus some help from Laplace boy. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.